If life is a journey, then grace is a roadmap. Journey Church is a spirit-led and grace-driven group of believers who recognize that sometimes the road of life has some potholes. But when we walk together, the destination is in reach. Join us now for an in-depth study and walk through the Word that will leave you refreshed, redeemed, and ready to face day-to-day challenges with an approach of grace and the love of your Father. Welcome to Journey Church. Well, we started a couple of weeks ago on a series on the Antichrist. And we sent out a message to you this week that Wednesday, during our Wine Press Bible Study, and for those of you who are missing it, you're missing a treat. We're back upstairs now in the Media Center where it holds about 150 people. So feel free to come. But our Wednesday night Bible study is where we go deeper into the Scripture. I try not to go too deep on Sundays because everybody's at a different level of understanding and at a different place. Wednesday night, you're free to ask questions. I'll stop and entertain any question that you have. But Wednesday nights, we just go verse by verse and pull it apart. This past Wednesday night... You see, Revelation chapter 13 ties into Revelation chapter 17. But when you get to chapter 17, you discover that the Antichrist, not the prophet, but the Antichrist, is not so much a person as it is a woman sitting on a city of seven hills riding on the beast, thus lending to the idea that the beast, the image, in technology speaking, could very well be a technological beast. Years ago, years ago, one of our families here in the church, I'd been teaching on this because I haven't taught on it in years. Because at the time I was in legalism, and when I taught on the Antichrist and the rapture and the second coming of the Christ, it was kind of scary and spooky. It wasn't with joyful adoration going, yeah, Jesus is coming, hallelujah, hallelujah. It was more like, oh, God, am I going to make it? Um, But one of our families, I I taught on this. uh, I discovered that that there was was some words for the word beast. It was an acronym. That it actually, there was a building in Brussels. um, And it was entitled, it was an eight-story building massive, massive supercomputer called the Brussels Economic Accounting Surveillance Terminal, or B-E-A-S-T. And one of our families was on a trip over there, and they went to the building and took pictures and brought them back to show me what was going on there. And I'm not sure if that technology is going to play into the end of day, because, but it is said that this supercomputer is satellite-linked, and that this computer is capable of handling trades and purchases from all over the world at the same time. That it's like the, it will be the primary cash register. That whoever this false prophet is will tie everything into. Again, there's just so much going on. It's, it's, it's hard to sort it out, figure it out, and hard to put your finger. The one thing I can put my finger on is that the Bible teaches that before any of this is displayed to the world, that the bride of Christ, the church, will be out of here. So the good news is, I'm not looking for the Antichrist. (laughs) I have found Jesus Christ. Amen. That makes all the difference in the world. But nevertheless, the Apostle Paul was dead ahead teaching to the church in Thessalonica about the Antichrist and about the return of the Lord. John was the only one to mention the word Antichrist. Antichrist goes by several several different names in the Bible. But the one thing that John would bring out in chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, what he would bring out is that there are many Antichrists in the world right now. And you've got to bear in mind, please get your head in the mind frame of where they were living. At the time Christ was born, 
there were already 13 men in Israel claiming to be the Messiah. So when Christ came along to them, oh, here's one more. But is that any different than the world we live in right now? Because right now we've got different churches set up and they're all claiming to have the way. And if you don't do it their way, you're not part of Christianity. Yet when you study the New Testament church, they were not divided by denomination. They were just divided by different towns. There was a Christian church in every town established by the apostles and the disciples of Jesus Christ. And they all lived and thrived off the teachings of the Bible, the same Bible that you and I have. And they all didn't get along, but they all tried to get along. And they all didn't get along within the church, you know, much like churches do today. If you've been in church any length of time, you know that some of the greatest fights in the world don't happen in Madison Square Gardens. They happen in churches. Can I get an amen? Oh, I've seen people slap each other in the parking lot. <clears throat> um, I've seen some, some wild stuff happen in church. So church is not a perfect place. And a lot of unbelievers or skeptics or even atheists will come to churches with their friends just to show them the hypocrisy in church. Well, beloved, let me help you with that just for a moment because hypocrisy, hypocrisy is not Christians acting stupid. That's just being human. Hypocrisy is when someone claims to be a Christian when they're really not. They're, they're in no way, shape, form, or fashion. But they want you to think they are. Much like in, in the New Testament we have, um, and, and I always get that couple wrong. Terry told me there are Ananias and Sapphira. If anybody remembers the story in New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira were in the church and part of the church and then they robbed the church and they fell over dead. Okay? And, and you understand that in, in 1 John chapter 2, John is making a reference. John says, they were in us, but they were not part of us. And then he goes on to say about many that had come, he said, they were in us, but they were not part of us. That's why they left. It's because they couldn't take what we were teaching and, and, and who we are in Christ, they, they couldn't do it. They wanted to come in to say they were part of the church for some political gain or financial gain or some sort of motivation that, that made them appear better or look better. They wanted to be part of the church crowd, but they didn't want anything to do with the sacrifice that comes of being a believer. And that's where you usually start thinning out the crowd is when you start saying, yeah, you know, when you give your life to Christ, things start to change. And for most churches, they, they, they start to, you know, stop drinking, stop smoking, stop cussing, stop sleeping around. You know, I trust that the Holy Spirit's going to lead you into those things. The sacrifice that we teach, that the Bible teaches, is the sacrifice of self for others. You see, the service of a Christian is to love others more than you love yourself, which means you start giving up spare time. You start giving up Saturday football games and Sunday football games because you're, you're busy helping, loving, serving someone else. This is where we draw the line, not just in America, but I've traveled in, in many, many foreign countries, and it doesn't matter where you go. You see people walking over trash. You see people walking by hurting people and broken people. They have money in their pockets and they're begging and they won't help. Because they're too busy guarding their own. Say things like, you know, well, yeah, I, I know that God, you know, it, it's all God's. But still, God expects you to be a good steward over what you've got. Well, yeah, that's true. But being a good steward means you know when to sow and where to sow. Doesn't mean you hang on to everything. Because, sweetheart, you can hang on to it all. Trust me, go ahead. Your children are going to enjoy every bit of it. And they're going to burn it up real quick. They're going to buy the things they always wanted that you wouldn't get them. And then celebrate you in the process. They might buy a big boat and put your name on the back of it. In fact, I can see the back of the boat now. It says, Daddy's Gone. That's the name of the boat. 
You're a whole lot better off enjoying what God's given you now and sowing it in places where it's going to change your life. See, I had a, I had a retirement account when we started a journey church with the denomination I was out of. And it had a little bit of money. It didn't have much, but it was all I had. And, and I called my bookkeeper, who was my cousin, and I said, what should I do with this? He said, oh, Tom, you better hang on to that. You know, one day, one day you're going to need that. And then here we were in a brand new startup church running 300 and some people and, and we didn't have anywhere to go and we needed the money for the first week's operation. And I got that check in the mail and I looked at it and said, well, do I give it to the church or do I put it in another bank account? And right out of nowhere, that still small voice said, do you trust me? That was all he said. That was all he said. I signed the back of that check, and I did not wait till Sunday. I carried it straight to our bookkeeper, and I handed it to him, and I said, just go ahead and put that in the bank. He said, Pastor, you're going to need that. I said, yeah, because I'm going to need this church. So I'm going to give that, and I'm going to trust God for everything else. God's not failing or let me down with anything that he promised because God doesn't lie. Say that with me. God doesn't lie. Now, it's because God doesn't lie that we have to understand when Jesus says, I'm coming back, he didn't lie. Now, I sat with a, a professional one day, a retired football player from the, uh, from the Washington Redskins, huge man, big guy. He actually came to church with me for a while, and he, he would sit and listen to me teach and and then one Sunday, he, he was gone for about a month, and he came back, and he said, Pastor, I need to talk to you. I sat with a minister up in Baltimore, Maryland, and he's, he's a doctor. Are you a doctor? I said, no, sir, I'm a redneck. <laughs> he said, well, I sat with this doctor, and here's what he told me. He said, the word rapture does not appear in the Bible. Therefore, all this stuff you're teaching about the rapture is not true. You see, this, this man w was living outside of his marriage with another woman. This man was not giving. He was uh, defrauding the government in several areas of his finance. Every time I ran into this guy, he was ashamed to see me because he knew I was coming to hug him. And it bothered him. His lifestyle bothered him. He came to church, but he wasn't one of us. And the last thing he wanted to hear was, Jesus was coming back, and if I'm not ready, I'm going to get left. Said, My God, he didn't want to hear that. I mean, who wants to hear that when you're running from God instead of running to Him? And I looked at him and I said, well, well, buddy, if that's true, we have some other problems. He said, well, what is that? I said, well, the word astronaut does not appear in the Bible either. Are they not real? I said, the word football does not appear in the Bible. Did you really play it? I said, here's a big one for you. The word Bible doesn't appear in the Bible. So what are you going to do now? He said, well, you kind of got me there. I said, no, you're kind of backing yourself in a corner. Just surrender your life to Christ. I can't. I'd have to give up too much. I said, you know, buddy, everything I gave up were things that hurt me. Everything I gained were things that have blessed my life. Some of us are just so fearful. But God doesn't give you the spirit of fear. That's the devil. Amen? Amen? So Paul, in spreading the gospel and teaching everything he taught, Paul would um, go to a little town called Thessalonica. He would raise up a church there. And this church was being sorely, sorely persecuted. Christians being killed by the dozens, loved ones being killed. And, and so the people in the church were... There, you know, Paul's teaching them. His first letter to the church in Thessalonica, he's teaching them. Jesus is going to come back, don't worry. In fact, if you read 1 Thessalonians, in every chapter, he mentions the return of Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1.10. 1 1.10. And let's, let's kind of follow along with me. 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Here's what he says. And to wait... For his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us 
from the wrath to come. Wait for his son in heaven. Okay? Look in 2, 19. Chapter 2, verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, say it with me, at His coming. Speaking of a future event. How about chapter 3, verse 13, where he says this. To the end, He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of His saints. Now, Paul wrote them this and got the church so excited. He got them so stirred up. You mean to tell, because they'd never met Jesus. They, they were in a different place in the countryside. They, they never met Jesus. They wanted to. They were in love with him. And they so wanted to see his return. And then, you know, their loved ones are dying and they're feeling, Oh my God, if Jesus is coming... All my loved ones that have died before me, are they, are they not going to see Jesus like I'm going to see Jesus? They're having a meltdown. Oh, God. So, and then, wouldn't you know it, people creep into the church. Teachers creep into the church. And y'all believe, do y'all believe teachers creep into church today? This always blows my mind. Listen, I, just over the years, I don't make a big deal out of it, but. Because these folks come and then they leave. But folks will come into church and they make a beeline to me and they're sure to introduce themselves and they're telling me their qualifications and, and then I take them out to dinner or take them out to lunch because I want to hear more of their story. And they share with me and, and in most cases, not every time, but in most cases, they, they honestly, they get close to me because they believe God sent them to help me because I've got it wrong. And I'm always amazed. I'm still amazed. They come to me and, you know, I worked with this and I did that. And I taught here and I've done this and I've done that. And, and, and Pastor, I just, I believe God sent me here to help you. And I'm like, well, thank you. What's God sent you to help me here with? You know, and I've heard things like, well, God sent me here to, you know, to help you better understand who he is. And I'm going... You do know I have the Holy Spirit. And he said I would have that no man would teach me anything. You do understand that. And you do understand that God sent you here. Is it possible I'm supposed to teach you something? Could it, could it be? And then they get frustrated with me in a short period of time because they, they sit down with me with things that are not right. And when I lay it out biblically and show them, they're, they're like... Phew. And they're at the next church trying to help the next pastor. I had a doctor come in one day. We had a doctor come in, and he, he wanted to set me straight. He sat me down, began to tell me all the psychology of how my father raised me and how what poor parent I was and how Terry and I didn't even really need to be married. And he was going through all this, and I believed him for a long time. And then all of a sudden, I realized he was the devil. So uh, <clears throat> I came in and said, you know, you just need to go. Well, it was no different then. Paul's established his church. He's raised them up. He's taught them. And other people are slipping into Paul's absence going, you know, the rapture's already taking place. It's already happened. And y'all missed it. Now, you talk about disappointing. Would that not be disappointing? If I stood up here today and through expounding on great words and infinite knowledge and I began pouring out pictures and illustrations, I looked at Pastor Tony and I said, Tony, you've got it wrong. All your life, Jesus has already come. Now you're stuck. You're stuck here. You're going to have to ride out the tribulation and live through all that hell. Listen, what I'm saying is not far-fetched. There is a movement going on right now in the world. It's called the Praetorist Movement. And these people all believe that Jesus has already come. They're taking all of the, the four happenings, the befores. The, for instance, there's been an abomination, a, a desecration abomination in the temple once already. It happened during the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes. 
And, and the Roman procurator over Jerusalem at that time offered a pig on the altar. And that set up the Maccabean revolt and broke uh, the, the Jewish people free from the Romans for a while. Now understand, they take that as being this final time. But understand, what, we're, what I'm fixing to start teaching you the next couple of weeks is going to beyond a doubt show you that when I get to Matthew 24, yes, Jesus is showing them the things that are fixing to happen. But he's also pointing toward something else that has not happened yet. And you get in the book of Revelation and John talks about the two witnesses. Men that are walking the streets of Jerusalem that will be killed and murdered by the hand of the Antichrist only. And the world will see them. The world will celebrate that these two witnesses are dead. Never have two preachers stirred up the devil more than these two men. And they're killed lying there dead in the streets of Jerusalem and the world We'll watch them resurrect and go to heaven. Imagine, just for a moment, if you will, on CNN. For the first time, CNN will tell the truth. On CNN, a reporter standing there, kicking dead bodies with flies on it, talking about those two men and how they came against the new world leader and how they did this and did that and all of a sudden the camera pans out and those two dead men are standing right behind him in the camera going <laughs> and then while the camera's on them they go Whoo. and the world still won't believe because they're so deceived in their mind I'm saying all that to say this is not a lie. The rapture is not a lie. No place is it better explained. 1 Thessalonians 4.15, Paul says this. He lays out a clear picture. And then I'm going to take you to 2 Thessalonians, where he had to write the second letter. About 10 days later, he sent a second letter to him because he got the word of all the stirring going on up in the church. In, in chapter 4, verse 15 of 1 Thessalonians, he says this, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them that are asleep. We're not going to stop the ones that are dead. 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remaining, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Here's the beautiful thing about what he said. Some people aren't going to have to die to see the rapture. I want to be one of them peoples. How about you? That's why Leon wants to be healed. He wants to make the rapture. He ain't scared to die. That's why folks up there struggle with their health. I'm not struggling with my health because I'm scared of dying. Are you kidding me? There are some days I pray, Lord, just right now would be a good time. Anybody ever done that other than me? See, People that come to church that don't know Christians. They hear us sing songs like, Will you meet me over yonder? And just inside the eastern gate. And won't it be glorious there? And then we face death and we're freaking out and falling apart. And they're going, How can you sing about that mess? And then it comes time to go and you ain't happy about it. Amen? Hmm, you're looking at me kind of cross-eyed there. <clears throat> So in 415, he paints a clear, clear picture. But let me show you something in Matthew 24. And we just go take a small portion because people say, oh, well, that was Paul talking about it. Well, what if I told you Jesus talked about it too? Let's go to Matthew 24. And we're going to start at verse 36. You ready? <clears throat> it says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. Notice he did not say season. Because Jesus would later on say, you will know the times and the season. But you won't know the day and the hour. He says, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Jesus is saying, I don't even know. Now let me explain something. If you want to do a cool, cool study, um, I, I don't, 
I don't use Google. We use DuckDuckGo. Google is a whole other crazy thing, but Google it if you want or DuckDuckGo it. It's another web search engine that won't hide things from you. Google hides stuff they don't want you to see. DuckDuckGo won't hide it. They also don't report you to the government. Anyway, type in the following. Type in the following. The Jewish wedding and the return of Christ. And what you'll discover is that the reason that in the law, in Deuteronomy, when God was giving them the ceremonial law, God laid out a form and function for a Jewish wedding. For them to come under the ketubah, them to, to, to enjoy what a Jewish wedding would look like. And then look at that, at the origins of the Jewish wedding, and then look at the return of Christ. It's the exact same thing. And the reason that Jesus doesn't know is because in a Jewish wedding, it was the, it was the husband-to-be's job to after he had proposed and they had written out a wedding contract. It was the Jewish husband's job to then go back and prepare a home on his father's house to take his bride into. And his father would not release his son to go get his bride until the house was completed and ready to be occupied. Amen. Oh, that's not all. You discover this. He never released his son until after or around the midnight hour. It was always dark. Because the point was, the bride, to be worthy of the son, always had to remain watchful and ready. Now watch. And when he would send his son out, before he sent his son, his son would be dressed in white garb so he could be seen at night in the torchlight. And forerunners prophets if you want to say would go out in front of him they would get two and three blocks ahead and they would hold up their lights and they would start hollering behold the bridegroom cometh behold the bridegroom cometh they would start shouting so that the bride could hear it and go oh oh there he is I better grab my stuff So you understand everything about the rapture of the church. The bride of Christ is set up exactly like a Jewish wedding. So beloved, hear me. For those of you who buy into the belief that Jesus would drag the church through the tribulation, nowhere in a Jewish wedding does the bride get drugged through the mud before she gets to the groom. No, honey. Her garments are spotless. And she is waiting, prepared. But remember, remember something, please. Right after this story, let me get through the story. I'm getting ahead of myself. I try to teach, and the preacher comes out to play. Oh. 37, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the Son of Man be. We'll get into that more next week. For as in the days that were before the flood... They were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Now understand, he's not saying there's anything wrong with those things. He's saying while they were doing those things, they didn't pay any attention. It was time to build a boat. And they didn't know until the flood came and it took them all the way. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two shall be in the field. One taken, the other left. Two women grinding, one taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord does come. But if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he'd have watched and would not have suffered his home to be broken up. Therefore, say it with me, be ye ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. First Corinthians says, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. One twenty-five thousandth of a second. If you divided a second down into 25,000 parts, one of those is how quick it's going to happen. Just one. Now, that may scare you, but only if you're an unbeliever. 
Because if you're a believer, you ought to go, whew, thank God for quick exits. Amen? <laughs> we ain't going to drag. It's just going to gone. Hallelujah. You think Jimmy John's is quick. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. Who then, verse 45, is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his own household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find him so to be busy about getting others ready to go. Verily I say unto you, he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant, notice there were both servants. Did you notice there was a good servant and an evil servant? Did you notice that what we just read, Jesus Christ himself said, two were together in the same place, one was taken, one was left. Anybody do math in the building? That is a 50% reduction. What Jesus is saying is 50% of those you go to church with don't know him. That's a staggering number. You see, we get back over where we were in Thessalonians. Paul's calling it this. Paul said, here's three things you know Jesus is fixing to come. And here's the big one. We're going to hammer on it next week. Here's the big one. He says, there will first come a great falling away. And he's not talking about in the world. He's talking about a falling away in the church, in the body of Christ. You see, listen, the word antichrist doesn't mean just someone who is against. It means someone who replaces. And when I get you back on over in Thessalonians, and I show you, I'm going to use the New King translation next week. And I'm going to pull up that word used for the enemy there because that word used in the Greek is antinome. He calls the Antichrist or the devil antinome. It means one who is against God's word. And today we are seeing the church. Not the lost, but the church turned against the very word of God. They are saying it's fallible. I, I heard one guy this past week say he was in his denominational headquarters. And they had their annual meeting. And that one of their men stood up and I wrote down the quote. Here's what one of the ministers at their annual meeting, thousands and thousands of people, here's what one of their leading ministers stood up and said, and I quote, I will not define my lifestyle or my sexuality by the four corners of this book. It is time for another testament to be written that is more up to date and written for the times we are living in. And he was greeted by a thunderous applause from his denomination. A denomination that, by the way, began the revival in the United States of America just four generations ago. Is there a great falling away going on? Where do you stand with the Word of God? Listen, Jesus goes on in, in this same section in Matthew. In this same section, most people that read Matthew don't connect the next three parables with what Jesus is saying. But you've got to remember this is all one conversation written very much in red. Right after Jesus is explaining this, he goes into three parables. And the very first one is the wise and foolish virgins. Ten virgins. All of them virgins. All of them heard the sound of his coming. But five of them weren't ready. Five of them were. You wonder why there's going to be a great revival after the rapture? Because all the almost got it now get it. You see, when you get to Romans 10, and Jesus through Paul, writing to us, the Gentile church, he says, you've got to present yourself as a living sacrifice. Too many of us, listen, we, 
we don't read the Bible. Because this is the only book that you don't read. It reads you. This is the only book when you pick it up. It's like a two-edged sword. It'll go in and divide. Listen, it says it, says it divides the spirit from the soul. Let me tell you what it's dividing. It's dividing your emotional life from your spiritual life. Too many people today in the body of Christ are led by what they feel and not what God said do or don't do. And they want God or some preacher to justify their behavior. Oh, but you don't understand. I don't have to understand. I've got orders from headquarters. And if I go by what I want to do, I'd be a schizophrenic, paranoid, psycho serial murderer. Why? Because I'm a preacher. And some of the people I deal with, it'd be easier just to kill them. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. You've got, you've got to understand. And, and we're told that as, as a nearing of Christ draws, the worse it's going to get. The enemy knows his time is short. And if the enemy can attack the constrainer, I'm going to carry you in Corinthians next week and show you that what's constraining the rapture is not, listen to me, beloved, it's not people had missionary to every, glo- every spot on the globe. The thing constraining the return of Jesus Christ is the church. It's the bride. It's the beloved. Why? Because she's not ready yet. Why is she not ready? Because the heralders, the men going out with the lights and the trumpets blowing, yelling, prepare the way, Christ is coming. They're still asleep. They're sitting in churches debating theology they're sitting in churches debating do you dunk them do you sprinkle them do you submerge them pastor what do you believe submerge them hold them down until you know they know jesus (laughs) don't let them up until they're going hallelujah underwater make it stick listen beloved why is he taking so long He's long-suffering toward us. He's not mad with you. He's waiting with anticipation every day for you to show up back home. Every day he's waiting for you so he can embrace you and say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joys of the Lord. He's prepared a mansion for you. A mansion you'll love. If you're a deer hunter, I imagine there are deer heads hanging everywhere. And they're not dead. They're alive. They'll sit there and talk to you. Because there's no death there. If you like to fish, he's got you a boat. If you like to sew, he's got you the best sewing machine on the planet. If you like to cook, you'll have a kitchen. How do I know? Because the Bible says God gives us the desires of our And yes, some of your heart's desires change when you get saved. Some of them don't. Because it's the beauty of how God made you. If there's a book you've never read, it was written in 1856. It's an old, old book. It's a short read. Written by a lady who died for five minutes and it was five years in heaven. The original book written in Old English was called Gloria Invictus. Written by Ruth Springer. But the name of the book translated in the bridge is called My Dream of Heaven. And she writes all about the mansions and how they're built. And the river of life. And every time you go in it, you come up younger. And how that when the leaves drop off of the tree, they just disappear. Because not even they're allowed to die. And now Jesus is walking around, hanging out, talking with people. With the British, he's drinking coffee. With the Southerners, he's drinking sweet tea. With the real rednecks, he's having some Dr. Pepper. He's just hanging out. He's hanging out and loving on his children because he couldn't wait for you to get there. And beloved, the rapture of the church is not some spooky event, but let me tell you this. It is the next event on God's calendar. Listen, imagine all those people that missed the first coming of Jesus when he was born in the manger. For the rapture of the church... It's going to be hard to miss. 
Because it's going to set this world into immediate chaos. Billions are going to be gone in a moment. It's going to change the economy. It's going to change the military. It's going to create a worldwide global disaster that the Antichrist will step in and go, I've got the solution. He may not even be in politics right now. He may be a businessman. He may be a big tech guru. But whatever he is or whoever he is, I believe he's on the world stage right now. And I believe he's getting ready to unite the world as one. Because finally, what Hitler couldn't do, what Mussolini couldn't do, what George Bush couldn't do, this Antichrist will do. He'll bring the world under one government, one order, one system. He'll bring peace to the chaos. There will be peace in the Middle East. Nobody's ever done that. And he will be worshipped as a God. Is that not what Satan said he wanted in the book of Exodus? To be worshipped as God. But then I read to you last week. I read to you last week. He's going to rebuild the temple in Israel. He's going to establish himself on the throne, on the mercy seat. He will sit on the mercy seat. And then he will offer a sacrifice. The Bible says it. The prophet will make the image speak. And they will worship the image. And every good Jew knows that God told them when you came out of it, came out of Egypt you will have no graven images and they'll all of a sudden realize uh oh the Gentiles were right Jesus has come the Messiah came and we missed him and the Bible says they'll flee to Petra if you've never been to Petra <laughs> it'll mess with your head that God's going to hold them there and they'll be raptured from Petra Halfway through the tribulation. There's some wild stuff fixing to happen. And you won't be here to see it. You're going to be at a wedding feast if you're a child of God. And if you're not a child of God, today's a good day to become one. All you got to do is say yes to Jesus. So you got to say he knows your heart. You got to have some fancy prayer. Just, oh Lord, save me. Boom, done. He stands at the door knocking. He just waiting on you to open it. How long has he been knocking? Long time. Just waiting on you. Thank you for joining us today at Journey Church. Join us on our journey. Contact us on the web at www.journeychurchmb.com. For Pastor Tom Wallace and all the congregation at Journey Church, may God richly bless you today.